Well, thank you all for being here, and, and uh, more importantly, thank for all the people standing behind me that, that are here to share their important stories. Uh, my name is State Senator Tony Huang. Um, we are here to talk about the concerns and the issues that, that, uh, that would befall us as a state and as a community with the expansion of gambling. Now, I'm going to begin this process and, and then I'll make the introductions to these critical people behind me that really have some compelling stories to share. First and foremost, I, I think when we look at the expansion of gambling and particularly in the casinos that are being before us in the General Assembly, the big issue is about jobs and our economy. Uh, I want to share with you a quote that's provided by Paul Tipinelli who is the executive director of the Bridgeport Regional Business Council. In addressing this issue of casino expansion, there, his quote was, the Bridgeport Regional Business Council does not believe that extended gaming will have a positive growth impact on our state's economy. He unfortunately is not able to join us today because he's up in Hartford, but that is a reaffirmation that the Regional Business Council in Bridgeport does not feel that casino expansion and gaming is going to have a positive influence in this. Um, I'm going to introduce to you Bob Steele. Bob is a former U.S. Congressman representing Connecticut's 2nd District. Bob has a long history of public service and civic engagement. He is a businessman and author of a book related to gambling in a nonfiction perspective, but also gathered from his experience in southeastern Connecticut with the growth of tribal gaming in uh, the Mashantuckets and the Mohegans. Um, and he's author of the book, The Curse of Big Time Gambling, uh, Seduction of Small New England Towns. And, and I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to introduce you to a man that I'm very fortunate to call my friend and someone who has taught me so much about the perils of gambling in our society. Bob, welcome. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tony, and uh, I want to say first of all that uh, Tony Wong is an enormously courageous state senator working for everybody in Connecticut in Hartford. Uh, he understands this issue uh, extremely deeply. He's doing his best to try to educate his colleagues, but it's a tough, tough task. If you don't think so, I'd like to quote from one of the Tuesday morning newspapers here in Connecticut where one of his colleagues in the Senate actually said the following. He said, I don't think we need to expand or it would be a good idea to expand gambling in Connecticut, but in this case it would help the people. Well, how it would help the people is very difficult to understand. It certainly wouldn't help the people economically because we know that whatever jobs and whatever revenue was produced would all come almost 100% from the losses, the gambling losses of Connecticut people. And secondly, so, so the economic impact would be zero. All the profits, all the jobs would be funded by the gambling losses of other people. And then you have to add on what happens because of the negative social and public health impacts. We know that these additional casinos, the, 12, the three that are being proposed, uh, would uh, expand uh, uh, the uh, frequency of people who are currently gamblers gambling in Connecticut. It would create thousands of new gamblers across the state with a corresponding increase in a gambling addiction, debt, bankruptcies, broken families, and crime. I would like in my brief time just to, uh, just to uh, uh, give you an idea of what the explosion of casino gambling across the United States is having in terms of an impact. This is from a new study from the Institute for American Values in New York, and it makes the following points. One, the new regional and local casinos, such as the ones they're talking about bringing to places like Bridgeport, are different from traditional Vegas-style resort casinos that catered predominantly to well-heeled players who came from long distances away and preferred table games. In contrast, the new casinos are primarily filled with a new generation of rapid play, highly addictive slot machines and cater overwhelmingly to middle and low, uh, 
rollers who come from an hour away, return frequently, and play the slots. Two, regional casinos build their customer base by encouraging repeat visits from local residents, which results in taking dollars out of a community rather than bringing dollars in. Three, while casinos represent themselves as benign entertainment companies, they are in fact predatory businesses that depend on problem gamblers for 40 to 60 percent of their profits. Five, living within 10 miles of a casino doubles the chance of developing a gambling addiction. Uh, and uh, six, uh, casinos constitute a regressive tax that hits low wage earners, minorities, and the elderly the hardest, thereby contributing to economic inequality in America. S uh, six, state sponsorship of gambling is a conflict of interest for state governments that are established to promote the general welfare, not prey on their most vulnerable citizens. Finally, according to this new landmark study, casinos drain wealth from communities, weaken nearby businesses, hurt property values, and reduce civic participation, family stability, and other forms of social capital that are at the heart of a successful community. Thanks very much. Bob, I've heard that before, and I've got to tell you, every time I hear it, it, it sends a, a, a gulp to me that we as a state are advocating and pushing for these kind of, these kind of revenue streams at, at the potential cost when the data is so alarming. But you, I think you raise a very interesting point. Um, we're helping people. And in all of this debate, we talk about gambling as a very benign revenue source. I hope that the rest of the people you'll hear from now will bring to bear that these are people's lives that we're impacting. And so now allow me to introduce you Joni Massat. Joni is a Plainville resident and is an advocate with Advocacies Unlimited. But more importantly, she is an individual that puts a face to gambling and its addiction and, and the potential impact it has on people's lives. These are stories and there are so many countless Jonies that we have ignored. And I hope that this is an opportunity for us today to put a face to gambling addiction, to know that it is your neighbor down the street. It could be your grandma. And those are people that matter in our lives. So without any ado, let me introduce you, Joni, and, and I think you'll really appreciate in listening to her story and knowing that this is part of life that we have turned our heads to. I first want to thank uh, Senator Tony Wong. Um, if I had not met him a short time ago at the LOB building, um, although I've shared my story many times, um, he's giving me a lot more courage, inspiration, and support to know that I need to share my story. I am what a problem gambler in recovery looks like. I innocently started about 12 years ago playing bingo. It was in, within a two year span that I lost my marriage, my home, my car, and I tell you that when I picked up my nine-year-old son to leave my home, we had just the clothes on our backs because I'd lost everything to my gambling. From there, I went to the extreme to embezzle funds from my then employer to support my gambling. And that led me directly to prison. I am one of those people in our average communities that problem gambling can destroy. There's so many people we need to reach out there because it's such a hidden addiction. And this will, it's just adding many more of our citizens into this 
addiction. And I am proud to say, as I said, I am in 12 years of recovery. My recovery is strong today, although it's still a battle every day, because everywhere you look, there's gambling. I am blessed and fortunate to be working with Advocacy Unlimited, who we oppose gambling expansion in our state, and I advocate for the people out there with problem gambling addictions. And again, thank you for allowing me to share my story, and I continue to do so, because it's great to have a good quality of life back today. Thank you. But Joni, don't, don't go. I, I, I want to address some of the concerns. I, I think you talked about ongoing process and the challenges of this. And, and, and I think one of the things that you shared with me is that gambling addiction and gambling debt is one of the highest causes of, of suicide. Yes. And, and the constant trauma and the challenges, I think even for you being up at Hartford, having to draw a number out of a hat was something for an individual like you with an addiction, you couldn't do. That, even that small, minute action that we take for granted, to you, causes a trigger. And, and I don't want to take other time, but because we have time for this, but, but I want you to share with our public and our community what it means living day to day with that challenge and the idea that we could potentially make that expansion and bring it to people's doorsteps. What does that mean? Absolutely. Um, with bringing three more possible casinos to our state and along with Keno, um, I was at the LOB to testify um, on the Keno bill and I was brought up to the table to sign in and I was asked to draw a my number to get in place of uh, when I would testify and there was this lovely little lottery box all co colorfully um, made a shoe box and I stood there and um, I was just amazed that this is how we um, line up for testimony and I was told it's the only fair way well I beg to differ because it took a lot of courage for me to not draw that number from that box and I stood there and I said to myself, this is my life today. I am not drawing a number from that box because I have no idea where it can lead me when I leave this building later today. God forbid if I had driven, um, draw a number one, that's all I could think of. Um, so I brought this to the appropriate um, AIDS attention and I'm amazed that it's the first time Maybe somebody else has brought it up, but that's got to be changed. I'm there to testify on a Kino bill, and I'm being asked to draw from a lottery box. It, 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 it's just, it doesn't make sense to me. But I was proud with some encouragement um, from Gary to speak up on how I felt. And um, I am going to advocate to get that uh, system changed. Mm -hmm. And, and like I said, it, it could have been as simple as it sounds, as I told our legislators that day. If I had picked number one, I won in my, in my mind of my gambling addiction. And that could have been devastating, and I wouldn't be here standing before you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joni is an example of so many others that are impacted by addiction, people that live in the shadows. But they're successful in carrying on productive lives because the people that you hear now are people that are active in those individuals' lives in supporting them. Um, they provide great resource, great counsel, and more than anything else, knowing that people care about them. Uh, I want to introduce you, Reverend Hopkins Scott. Hop, Hopeton. That's, that's okay. Correct me. Um, <laughs> yes, turn of hope. Has been a senior minister at the First Baptist Church in Bridgeport since 1995. He studied theology at the University of West Indies 
and earned a bachelor's degree in political science in Central Connecticut State University. He was the editor in chief of the campus newspaper. So, Reverend Scott? Yes, yes, yes. Please, welcome, and thank you very, very much. Thank you, Tony. Good afternoon. Almost uh, 20 years ago, I stood with other religious uh, leaders in the greater Bridgeport area to oppose a plan to build a casino in Bridgeport. That plan failed. And despite many challenges, Bridgeport has survived and has thrived without a casino. Today, I stand with concerned religious and civic leaders to oppose yet another attempt to bring casino to Bridgeport. Many of the arguments offered 20 years ago in support of casino expansion are being regurgitated even today. We are being told that there will be economic benefits including more jobs for residents of this area. I believe that the pumped up promise of positive economic benefits is a gigantic mirage. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about that a lot with gambling, right? Yes. The competition for gaming dollars is already fierce for a small state such as ours. In the past 20 years, our neighboring states have added casinos within their borders. There is a finite amount of money available for gaming. Moreover, the recent financial losses and the cutting of jobs in the casinos in our state are uncontested facts that promises of gain and are dried up and empty. The gaming business is too saturated in this part of the country to sustain the profits the casinos would desire. Gambling is a risky business and Bridgeport can ill afford to risk its future on this kind of business. What the residents of this state need is not a bucket of empty, petty promises of game of chance or luck, but productive employment that provides personal fulfillment and a living wage. I am not here to say gambling is an evil, but we have seen in our own work persons who have been severely damaged by their addiction. And we believe that there are other ways for persons uh, to gain the, the economic benefits that they desire outside of gaming. And so I implore our political leaders to continue to seek ways to attract and expand growth producing businesses. That's what we need now. Thank you. Well done. I think what you will find with each increasing uh, presenter that it's a good thing I'm only the moderator and staying out of this conversation because they're so eloquent. Uh, we follow that with Reverend Sarah Smith. She's a senior minister of this city and, and the church in which uh, we are being hosted at. You can drive across in two hour state. Has led the way in human rights, in forward thinking and problem solving. We are the constitution state because nobody else could figure out how to write one. Friends, casinos will not help the people of this state. They're not going to move us forward, and they're not the solution to our problems. And I can't stand idly by while the people of my congregation and the neighbors right across the street that we feed each week are offered another roll of the dice as a promise of false hope. What happens in Vegas should stay in Vegas. <laughs> this is Connecticut. We can do better. And I'm willing to bet on our ingenuity, our hard work, and our community mindfulness to get us there. This is Connecticut. And I'm willing to bet that you and me working together can create the kind of community that we would be proud to call home. This 
is our home. This is Connecticut. And casinos are not our answer to a better life, a healthier citizenry, or a revived economy. And you can bet on that. Can I drive you up to Hartford every single day? <laughs> as long as you know I'm a Democrat. Uh, that's all right. You know what? Uh, I got to tell you, whatever it is you're selling, I'm buying. Um, and and, and, and I, I have to tell you, this is the kind of inspiration that matters in people's lives, not the selling of a mirage and a dream. And, and I feel bad for Mr. Douglas Varga, who's got to follow that. <laughs> But, but Doug is a board member of the Greater Council of, of Churches in Bridgeport, uh, a Fairfield resident, an attorney, um, and I, we felt it was important to have him offer a perspective to recognize that as we talk about expansion of gambling and, and casinos and the possibility of it in Bridgeport, that it is not simply a Bridgeport issue. It is a Connecticut issue. And uh, I love to be able to invite Doug up to the podium and following up Reverend Smith and uh, and offer his perspective. So, your 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 turn. Thank you so much, Senator Wong, for slotting me behind <laughs> Sister Sarah. Um, my name is Doug Varga. I'm an attorney in Southport, as Senator Wong has said. Uh, I grew up in the area, and I reside in the area, and my family resides in the area. I and those I know are concerned about the area. I do have a few comments to make this afternoon about the Senate bill that's being opposed right now. Um, I will curtail my remarks because, as is an unusual circumstance for an attorney, I'm now following politicians and preachers, <laughs> and it's no contest. Uh, so uh, what I would like to say, as Senator Wong has mentioned, is that while the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport's primary mission is to serve at-risk individuals within the area of our influence, which is the Bridgeport area, it is the Council of Churches of Greater Bridgeport. Our congregations span the Greater Bridgeport area and include exterior communities, all of whom help to contribute to make the lives better for those who our social service programs affect. What I would like to add to the discussion here today is that the problem of gambling is one that is empirically proven to affect not only disadvantaged people economically, it affects the lives of everyone uh, who becomes afflicted. We heard from Joni uh, previously, she uh, does not live in an urban area, uh, but she has been affected. Her life has been affected, her family's life has been affected. Gambling is a problem that afflicts the entire community, not just the inner city. And this bill is one that would expand gambling into areas that frankly don't need to have that expansion. And I would just add uh, the study that Senator Steele mentioned before by the Institute for American Values is one that anyone interested in this subject should read because it is a comprehensive study, it is well sourced, and I have yet to see uh, any legitimate criticism of that study, except uh, perhaps by the gaming industry, and I wouldn't necessarily consider that a legitimate response to the study. Uh, but those are my remarks. I do appreciate Senator Wong's very courageous efforts in fighting this bill because we have to understand that it's not an easy path for him to take under the circumstances, but those of us uh, in the Council of Churches certainly appreciate Senator Wong's efforts, and we hope he continues those efforts to a final conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, that, 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 that was very helpful and a, and a very different perspective, so thank you very much. And, and it's a fight that we all should take on because every life matters and and that's really what we're talking about here that uh, if we believe in the human dignity and the respect that gambling is a illness and an addiction that every life deserves an opportunity to be successful to be happy and and you know as a role as a legislator there's nothing more important that we have 
And as I look back, I, I want to introduce Reverend Cass Shaw, who has been tremendous in, in this whole effort. Uh, as the executive director of the Greater Bridgeport Council of Churches, she has brought a, a resiliency and, and, and a focus to, to, to educating me on some of these issues. But she also brings a different context that she had served in Cape May and has seen how Atlantic City and how the devastation of gambling has impacted those surrounding communities. But most important of all, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say I want to thank her and the Greater Bridgeport Council of Churches for your leadership in caring about the people that you serve and, 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 and represent. So please. Thank you, Tony. Absolutely. So the proposal is to build convenience casinos along uh, 91, 84, and then 95 perhaps. For whom are convenience casinos convenient? Interstate 95 is the main south-north trafficking route in the east. It's very convenient for those who want to peddle drugs and young girls. So now we're going to add gambling to that volatile and ugly mix. On routes 91 and 94, and then, of course, 95, right here in the Bridgeport area. These casinos are convenient in the worst way, playing into the hands of those who prey on the vulnerable. The argument that they bring in much needed revenue is, as others have said, smoke and mirrors, and a short-lived benefit at best. John Wilson wrote a comprehensive article for the, New York Time, for the New Yorker in November, in which he laid out the long-term consequences for states that get into the casino race. The gambling market is already saturated. We've all seen the photos of the shuttered casinos in Atlantic City and elsewhere. You might think, fair enough, in a free market system, casino operators take a risk and then take the consequences. But this is not entirely a free market enterprise. And the casino operators aren't the only ones bearing the risk. Every state that has licensed commercial casinos has become a partner in that business. The states collect millions of dollars in fees and tax revenues. And then the trouble starts when they become dependent on those gambling revenues to pay their bills. Delaware, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and too many other states have allowed casinos to proliferate and have become dependent on that revenue to balance their budgets. Then they are all too vulnerable to the casino's demands for subsidies and tax relief when things get tough. It's only taken a few short years for the tables to turn. These states are now paying out millions of dollars propping up failing casinos. If Connecticut joins the casino race, we will not only be setting up our low-income residents who are particularly vulnerable to the lure of gambling, we will be setting us all up to play a game that none of us can win. In the late 70s and early 80s, I was a pastor in Cape May, New Jersey, and worked hard with other religious leaders to try to figure out how to deal with all those people who saw Atlantic City as the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and came on buses from all over the country getting off at that bus station and discovering that it was indeed a mirage. Let's not go that route. I urge our legislators to stand up, to stay clear, and to keep Connecticut free of any more expansion of casinos. Thank you. We cannot say enough uh, about all of the people behind me who, who give of their time and their efforts to, to, to serving our community. This is a, a course that uh, we don't feel is appropriate for the state of Connecticut, uh, particularly not at this time when the state is uh, uh, apparently grasping for straws when it comes time to determine how it could raise additional funds to fund the responsibilities of state government. Uh, a few years ago, they enjoyed the largesse of uh, casino gaming. Uh, however, that, that, that source of income has been dramatically reduced because the infatuation with, uh, with casino gaming has faded. It, it has clearly not proven to be the, uh, the answer, uh, the panacea, if you will, to uh, the, the state's uh, the state's fortunes. 
Uh, there's some very, very serious concern about the constitutionality of casino gaming because of the way it is being proposed. It is giving license to the two existing uh, casinos to expand their activities. And uh, there's some serious concern about whether or not Connecticut is making itself vulnerable to some very serious legal action as a result of taking this particular tack and the way it's going. So I don't know how anyone has expressed views about this uh, earlier, but uh, at this point in time, we see absolutely no justification for the reliance uh, of the state of Connecticut on casino gaming to extricate itself from, uh, from, from its, its, its uh, mis misfortunes in, in, in the management of, of, uh, of its funding, particularly in, in recent years. I'm a former state representative. I served in the General Assembly some years ago when the state of Connecticut, I think, was uh, a little bit more prudent and sane about how it approached uh, its, its need to, to fund for the uh, responsibility of, of serving its citizens. And we never seriously even entertained a concept of, uh, of, of using casino gaming as the answer to our problems. And I think that there's still the legitimacy uh, of, of, of that, that mentality of, uh, of pursuit in, uh, in, in, in state government. Uh, we've got some very, very fine legislators, many of whom uh, disapprove of this, uh, uh, of, of this action that's being considered. And that's, that, that's very realistic because the state can be much more sensible, much more prudent about how it approaches its concern, about how it should fund itself. And quite frankly, casino gaming is not the way to go. Thank you. I wish we could uh, get our legislators and people who are pro-gambling at this particular time to take a real look at what's happening in the state. If we were just bring that amount of energy with the poverty-stricken people in, in the state of Connecticut, and it's going downhill as I stand here, and there's very little effort to deal with it. This is a moral issue, and we take that, stay on the sidelines, and don't do what we should be doing for people who don't have food to eat, places to stay, they don't have jobs, and we keep asking ourselves about how crime is increasing in Connecticut, in Bridgeport, uh, in all of the towns, Stratford, Stanford. Well, that's going to continue to happen until we can come up with some real ideas that first respect the people who need this assistance and be there to assist them and learn to work together and to know that in this instance, uh, the game here in the city of Connecticut will not address any of the real issues that we as people from this great state can and should be doing. A few years ago, uh, the legislators in the General Assembly said they would alleviate <coughs> poverty among youth in the state of Connecticut by 2015. I don't have my watch. <coughs> it hasn't happened. It's gotten worse. Uh, in this great state of ours, the uh, achievement gap uh, between students here in the state of Connecticut, especially minority students, is the highest in the, in the country. Yet we stand on the sidelines and watch those kinds of things happen. And I just like to suggest to our friends, to all of us, uh, that we can do better. Uh, this is a moral issue, and we need to be on the right side of it. <coughs> I don't speak uh, on how great we are or to tell people what the positive things are until we take care of, of these situations. Thank you.
thank you all for being here, and I want to thank the audience behind me, but Charlie brings up a good point, and for his incredible service in the community. We've not talked about the youth that may be impacted by gambling, that may be another issue, but, but we have a, a role and a responsibility to be better role models. And, and um, Charlie is one that, that has demonstrated that, and I hope that we as legislative leaders moving forward will do what is best in the best interest of the people of our state. So thank you for all being here. Thank you. Thank you.